Hello and welcome to episode 395 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, we're back, we're in the office together and why not start this podcast with how we started previous podcasts with a quick heads up about our podcast meetup and actually this is the last time we'll do it because it's imminent, it's this week isn't it? It is this week, so we've mentioned it on the previous podcast, please come and join us on Thursday the 8th of December, so this Thursday from 6.30, we'll probably be there at 6 six o'clock to be quite frank in central london i can confirm the pub that we're going to go to is the same pub that we've done the past podcast meetups in across keys on grace church street in the city directly opposite leadenhall market which is the birthplace of money to the masses the reason we haven't said the pub beforehand is because the pub had been closed for refurbishment but it is now open and it will be open on Thursday. So please do come and see the team. It would be fantastic to meet as many of you as we can and it will be incredibly motivating for the rest of the team to see you guys because most of the team have never been to a podcast meetup and so a bit of fun before Christmas and for us to meet the listeners. And because obviously cost of living crisis, I think we've done the right thing and we've chosen a Weatherspoons pub to meet up in. One of the cheapest pubs that you can buy a pint in London. So why not? So don't Don't forget, for more information, go to moneytothemasses.com forward slash event, where you'll find details of the event, including a map of where it's being held as well. Okay, so let's move on to what we've got coming up on this week's show. Three pieces as normal, I'm assuming, Dave? Yeah, three pieces as normal. We've got an investing piece this week, which I'm going to kick off with. And it's when cash isn't king. So it's an interesting piece of research that I carried out for 8020 investor members, but about the amount of cash that funds hold, which most investors don't realise. So some of the things you need to be aware of and look out for. At the end of the podcast, I'm going to do a piece on something called the Diderot effect. Linked nicely to the previous podcast I did on habits, but it's something that will help you live within your means. And the other piece we're going to do, Andy, is on... Just a quick piece on pensions. There's been some news announced about mistakes that DWP have made the Department for Work and Pensions and really what that means and who has been affected because there may well be listeners or certainly family members of listeners that may have been affected and can do something about it. Okay, so let's start with the investing piece then. When cash isn't king, you've done a piece of research for 8020 members and you're going to give us the highlights in this piece. Yeah, so this week I sat down and did some analysis for 8020 investor members. So if you want more details of what I'm about to talk about, the full details, then you can obviously take out a free trial of 8020 Investor and you can see and read the research. But cash does have a place in a portfolio, like 2022, when you get a period where bonds and equities tumble together, then cash can be a good haven. And in fact, you can make a positive return in a year where lots of other assets have made a negative return. In fact, my own 50k portfolio, which I run on 8020 Investor, has had at least 5% cash allocation this year, which has helped preserve the capital of that portfolio over the year. But there is something that investors probably are not aware of. So when you have a, whether it's a pension, it could be an ISO and you invest typically in a fund, whether that be an investment trust or a unit trust, the fund that you invest in will have a mandate. And that mandate tells you what the fund manager plans to invest in and how the fund's going to be run. So it could be a mandate that means that the manager is going to invest in UK companies of a certain size, for example, and they're going to aim to produce a return that beats a benchmark which they state but of course it doesn't state exactly which companies they're going to buy or which shares they're going to hold that is down to the discretion of the manager if it's an actively run fund meaning there is actually a person running the money if it's a tracker for example then it will just track let's say it's a FTSE 100 tracker it will just replicate the shares in the FTSE 100 so it's automated and it will be lower cost as a result but one of the issues is that fund managers will hold cash 
from time to time in their funds. Now, typically, that cash is only a temporary holding because they may be trying to facilitate transactions. So they may have sold some assets or be planning on buying some assets. Or in the case of unit trusts, they may be facilitating withdrawals and encashments by investors. So if you want to withdraw your money from a unit trust because of the structure, then they may need to hold elevated cash levels to facilitate their withdrawals rather than having to sell assets. Now, how much cash does a unit trust, for example, typically hold? Well, as part of the research I carried out for 8020 Investor, I analysed over 1,200 unit trusts and over 60 investment trusts that come from a range of sectors, which means they invest in a range of different types of equities. So that could be American equities, it could be emerging markets, it could be Asian equities, a range of assets that could be bonds, it can be equities, it can be property, and looked at each fund and found out how much cash they disclose as holding. Now that can obviously vary over time, but I could only use the latest information to go on. And of course, when you carry out these things, different managers identify assets in slightly different ways. So some of them will be identifying cash-like investments. So they're not cash technically, but they behave much in the same way as cash and they can therefore be bundled up into that cash allocation on their fund fact sheet. So that's a quick note. If you ever want to find out a fund's cash allocation, look at their fund fact sheet, which you can find on your platform that you use or by going directly to the provider, you'll see the amount of cash they hold. Now, I analysed all of those funds and the typical unit trust on average, across all of those sectors, held just under 5% of their assets in cash. So that's your benchmark. That's a big takeaway for you out there when you're listening to this, you're looking at your pension fund maybe, or your investments, and you're sitting there thinking, how much do the funds that I invest in hold in cash? Now, the reason why cash can be a problem is because if you hold too much cash, in a portfolio, then over the long term, that will eat away at your returns because there's the opportunity cost of investing in other asset types, for example, equities. Yes, there are the dangers of losing your money and ups and downs, but there is a greater growth opportunities. If a fund manager held a large portion of their fund in cash, what that will do, it will not only provide a drag on the potential performance of their fund, but more worryingly, you are still paying the annual management charge to that fund manager for the privilege of them not doing their job and holding elevated cash levels. And when I say elevated cash levels, when I carried out the analysis, there are funds out there that may be holding more than 20% of the assets in that fund in cash. Now, it means that a lot of people out there may be holding more cash in their portfolio than they actually realise. And that's because the managers of the funds that are in their portfolio may be holding these elevated cash levels. So holding cash isn't bad in the short term. Like I said, I've done it this year. But when it's an active decision that you carry out, then that is one thing. But when your cash levels are increasing and you are unaware, then that can be a problem. It does explain why some of the funds you might see that have outperformed this year have actually outperformed because they may have these elevated cash levels. So I went through all of the funds and looked at the cash allocation they had. I produced these lovely, beautiful heat maps, I have to say, Andy, that show the funds that had less than 5% cash, so that's acceptable. Funds that had between 5 and 10% allocation to cash, those that had between 10 and 15, and then those that had over 15%. There are the alarm bells ringing. So then investors could go and look at those funds, if they hold them, go and find their fact sheets, try and find out the latest information about how much cash they hold. So that is something for people to do, listen to this podcast. Have a look at a fund fact sheet, particularly those that you hold, see how much cash fund managers are holding. Because like I said, for unit trust, the average cash allocation is 4.87%. If you start going above that, then that is above average. But what is interesting is as I went through and did the heat maps, obviously I can't show you that on the podcast, but there were some other interesting findings. Because as I mentioned, you are still paying the management charge to the fund manager, even on the portion of the fund that's in cash. Now, there have been instances where some funds have waived that, particularly on property funds that have held large portions of cash to meet redemption requests from investors. But that's unusual. And what I did is I thought, well, let's have a look at the charge that these funds apply and compare it to the cash allocation. And what I found was there was a trend that the higher the charge a fund had, the greater the chance that it had a higher than average cash allocation. So I bunched all these funds into groups of those funds that had 
had less than 5% cash allocation, then those funds that had between 5 and 10% cash allocation, those that had 10 to 15% in another group, and the final fourth group were those that had more than 15% cash allocation. And then I looked at the annual charges of all the funds in each group and found an average for each group and then put them in order. Well, lo and behold, they actually went from the funds with the lowest cash allocation had the lowest charges. So typically that was 0.82% per annum up to those funds that had the highest cash allocation where the average charge was 0.986% per annum, which is obviously a significant difference. So why could that be? And looking at it, I think it actually reflects active management. So active funds, so those funds that have a fund manager that runs and invests your money, they will be making changes to portfolios. So they will be trying to buy and sell investments, but they will presumably be trying to do it based on their own view or their own research. And therefore, they're more likely to hold elevated cash positions based on that research or their own view of what's happening in investment markets. If you looked at the pattern, because I actually did a scatter graph of all these funds of their cash positions versus their charges, the lower you went down the charges axis, so when you went down to paying perhaps less than 0.2% per annum for a fund, which would more than likely make it a passive investment, so a form of tracker, the cash allocation was negligible. It was probably not even 1% in most cases. It was certainly a lot less than 5%. So what you're seeing is that actively managed funds, which tend to charge more, tend to have higher cash allocations, which obviously goes against everything you might think because you're paying more money for having less of your money actually invested. So if you want to remain invested in the market fully, then the message would be you would probably go towards those funds that are cheaper, presumably those tracker funds. So what I also did is thought, well, that's interesting. Is there a trend for different types of fund to have higher cash allocations? And so I looked at the average cash allocation of every unit trust sector. So I looked at all the sectors, grouped the funds together, worked out that average cash allocation to see if there was a discernible trend. And there was. The sectors where you're more likely to be holding funds with high cash allocations are those from the flexible investment sector, the mixed investments 0 to 35% shares sector, the specialist sector, which is that weird group of just random funds that don't fit in any other sectors, the sterling high yield sector, the targeted absolute return sector, and the UK direct property sector. Those sectors tended to have over 7% held in cash. And in fact, the ones that had more than 10% were the mixed investment sector that I mentioned, the sterling high yield sector, and the targeted absolute return sector that I mentioned. So again, why would that be? And looking at it, I think those sectors tend to be those that have funds that may invest in alternative asset types, some of those that can be deemed like cash-like, which could be some short-term government bonds. So there could be a bit of crossover there that elevates, inflates their actual cash position. But the other thing is a lot of funds in particularly the targeted absolute return sector, if you look at their benchmark on the fact sheet, so go and find one, you will see there are a benchmark that might have some kind of cash reference. So it might be a cash plus 2% or some cash benchmark plus a certain percentage. If you target a cash plus return, the chances are you're going to gravitate towards some cash type assets as well. And if you look at the targeted absolute return sector, look at the average return over the last few years, it's produced a pretty flat return maybe no more on average than maybe a couple of percent a year and some years obviously it's down now that's probably because they do hold some elevated cash position so that's something to be aware of and it's why probably the targeted absolute return sector certainly in 2022 up until november it was probably one of the best performing sectors out of all of them but interestingly i then looked at the average annual charge of funds in each sector. And while it's not a direct correlation, oddly, the sectors that I've mentioned, particularly the property sector, tend to have slightly higher charges than some of the other sectors out there. Now, another reason I just want to point out why the UK direct property sector has elevated cash positions is because that is likely down to the liquidity issues. That could be a reason why some funds have elevated cash positions. If you invest in buildings, you can't sell part of a building very quickly. You can't even sell part of a building 
building, but you can't sell property very quickly to give investors their money back. With unit trust, that's what would happen if you had a mass redemption. So to avoid gating the fund where they stop redemptions, funds will hold elevated cash positions. And so you see that occasionally, which is why that sector is prone to it. That is often why you'll hear the advice. If you want to invest in property via a fund, then investment trusts are better suited because their structure isn't such that the fund manager has to sell the assets. They actually are investment companies, effectively, and you'll buy and sell shares in that investment trust. And what the manager's doing over there makes no difference. They don't have to sell any assets. With a unit trust, the way it works is that the manager creates and destroys effectively units in a fund, which therefore means that they have to sell assets or invest your money when you give it to them. So a different structure. Now, what that might lead you to think is, well, that means that investment trusts hold lower cash positions. Well, I thought that. But when I looked at the 60 investment trusts and analyze them, the average cash position across those was 6%. So that's markedly higher. And also the average annual charge was marginally more as well. So the takeaways from this research is that be aware that funds do hold cash positions and they can be only temporarily, but sometimes they can be for longer periods of time. Less than 5% is usual and ideal. Funds that are actively managed tend to hold more cash positions and they also tend to charge higher fees. So you are paying for the privilege of having your money not invested and sitting in cash. Investment trusts don't hold less cash on average than unit trust. In fact, it's the other way around. And certain types of funds from certain sectors do tend to hold higher cash positions. So make sure if you have any of those in your portfolio, you're just aware of it. Normally, it doesn't become a problem. But if you have a fund that performs well in an environment where, say, equity markets or bond markets fall, and that fund is supposed to invest in those particular assets, if it's held up well during a period, just double check what the cash position is. Because it could be not that the manager has actually done anything amazing. It's just the fact they haven't been in the market. And you want to see how that's changed over time as well. Maybe keep an eye on it. And of course, one thing to bear in mind, it isn't necessarily an issue if a fund manager has cash, because if they are delivering on the other portion of the investments and blowing the lights out, then what would you care if they held elevated cash positions? But over the long term, holding higher cash positions does prove a drag on performance. And I did carry out research in the past that looked at the areas where active fund managers beat passive fund managers. And there are a few sectors where it tends to happen over the longer term, one of them being the smaller company space in the UK and European equities. So just be aware, keep an eye on the cash positions, look at the performance over the short term, but also over the longer term as well, if you're looking at these funds, just to see if the fund manager is really earning their money. Okay, so moving on to the next piece then, Damien, and I'm going to be covering pensions. And it was reported in the news in recent weeks that the DWP, the Department for Work and Pensions, are having some issues. They've admitted to historic errors. Now, these are human errors that they've made when calculating state pensions. So following a review back in January 2021, it identified a number of groups that they knew had been underpaid, and actually some dating back to 1985, estimating a total of £1.4 billion has been underpaid and they are working through the backlog to make sure that these people are reimbursed. Now, the reason it's hit the news in recent weeks is that these 237,000 people that they originally identified has actually been creeping up. As they've been digging deeper, they found more and more issues. And so it's likely now that instead of being resolved by the end of 2023, when they initially hoped, it's going to push way into 2024. And to be honest, the likelihood is it will probably take longer. The reason I'm bringing this to the pod is that there are a number of groups of people that have been affected. And I thought it was worth highlighting who those are because there may well be some listeners or family members of listeners that have been impacted by this. And there is actually something you can do rather than just sit and wait and hope that the DWP contacts you. There is a way that you can proactively try and get this sorted. Now, most of those that are affected are people who are on the basic state pension. So that's people who reach pensionable age prior to April 2016 before the rules changed and it moved over to the new state pension. And the four main groups are widows or widowers that should have inherited an enhanced state pension following the death of their spouse. Also married women that should have received an upgrade to 60% of the basic state pension when their husband retired. The over 80s who should have been automatically upgraded to a 60% basic state pension. And also parents and carers that stayed home to look after children 
under the Home Responsibilities Protection Scheme. So there's an easy way that you can go online and check to see if you have potentially been impacted. It may take a little bit of time because they will need to get back to you, but you need to go on the gov.uk website. And so go to gov.uk forward slash contact dash pension dash service. Again, we'll put details in the show notes and you can click on the links through the show notes there. And from there, you could submit a pension query and you'll need to have your name, your date of birth, national insurance number to hand. And that will start the ball rolling. But bear in mind, you you will have to remain patient because there is already quite a large backlog. Interestingly, you can also get in touch with the DWP on behalf of a family member who has since died. So if you know someone who's likely to have been underpaid their state pension and who has since died, you can still claim Now, this link is too long to read out on the podcast, but again, I'll put the link in the show notes. Again, you'll just need to provide as much information as you can, but because you're doing it on behalf of someone else, you'll need to provide your relationship to the deceased person, whether you're an executor of the estate, your telephone number and address, as well as the name, date of birth, national insurance number, and any other relevant details of the person who has died. So that's obviously good news. Now, I've covered quite a lot there. There's a lot of details in there. I'll put details in the show notes so that anyone who listens to this and thinks that yep that's me or I know someone who's probably going to be affected by that can go and check out the details and no doubt there'll be further information relating to this that comes out in the news in the coming months and the show notes will have a link to the article that Andy's actually written on this topic on the website that you can find all those details in right the final piece on the podcast is about something called the Diderot effect now this I came across and I thought was incredibly interesting and we often talk about people struggling to live within their means and we often have difficulty with overspending it's something that most people encounter at some point and something you have to conquer if you want to try and take control of your money and ultimately build wealth over time now the Diderot effect is named after a 18th century philosopher. His name was Denis Diderot, and he wrote an essay titled Regrets on Parting with My Old Dressing Gown, which seems a rather unusual title, but it explained some of the reasons for overconsumption. So it explored that area. And since then, the term Diderot effect has been coined to explain some of the behavior that we all from time to time exhibit. So there are two parts to this effect. The first one is that we tend to purchase goods that align with our sense of identity. And so we will complement our possessions to align with that identity. So we'll buy things that go together, whether that might be the way we coordinate our clothing, our possessions in our house, the way we decorate things, the types of car that we own. For most people, they give a sense of their self to the outside world and a sense of status. The other part to the Diderot effect is because we have a tendency to align ourselves with the possessions that we have, then if we introduce a new purchase, we buy something that deviates from the current complementary set of possessions, it can then result in a wave of new possessions to match the new one that we just acquired. Now, in the essay that I mentioned, Diderot talks about he receives a gift of a dressing gown. And as a result of this dressing gown that is very nice, he then looks at the other things in his home that look much too drab in comparison to this new wonderful dressing gown. And it starts him replacing items like, for example, a chair or some clothing, and then it moves on into maybe the desk and the pictures. And in the end, the spiral of purchases drives him into debt. So If you think about it, we have all done this at some point. So it may be that you were at home and your partner decided to bring something, buy a new picture, a new mirror. And as that doesn't really go with the rest of the house, the next minute you've started redecorating the room and then now you've got a nice new painted room. The old sofa doesn't look very good. So you want to get the new sofa. And before you know it, you've actually spiralled into a whole wave of new purchases that actually stemmed from a single purchase that didn't fit with the complementary ones that you were quite happy with. And it was quite interesting. There was a quote at the end of his essay where he says that I was the absolute master of my old dressing 
dressing gown, but I've become a slave to my new one. And then concludes with, beware of the contamination of sudden wealth. The poor man takes his ease without thinking of appearances, but the rich man is always under strain. So we can all come up with times where this Diderot effect has taken place in our lives. It might be you buy a new jumper or you might buy a new item that you want to wear out somewhere. And the next thing you do is it can spiral into, well, I've got to have this new item of clothing. I've got to have somewhere nice to go and wear it. So therefore you decide to go out for a nicer meal. So what I want people to do is realize the power of this effect. And if you can control it, it can help you start to become perhaps happier, but also also control your spending. So how do you combat it? Well, the first thing is, as I mentioned, is look for it and observe it in other people, but more importantly, in yourself. And then one way you can try and stop the impact is if you buy something, then try and work out what the potential further purchases could lead on to and then calculate what the cost of those purchases are. And then you can make a decision whether you actually want to buy this new thing or not. So it may be that you end up buying some golfing lessons. Next minute, you've bought a whole new set of golf clubs and golf paraphernalia and you spent thousands and you never never end up really using it. Have a think about that. The other thing is going back to that habits podcast I did a couple of weeks ago, a good habit is delaying the impulse purchases. So wait in 24 48 hours if you see something you like before you buy it that can counter some of this effect because then you don't necessarily buy something out of impulse that could then set off a cascade of events and also drive you into debt the other thing implement zero spend days as i mentioned in last week's podcast because that can start breaking the habit and the other thing is don't define yourself by what you own which is a big thing and i think that even for me personally one of the things that people will laugh at is that i don't really value individual possessions overly and when i clothes i wear or anything like that moving on from having to own brands and stuff like that will help combat this Diderot effect and the other thing is seek value and usefulness in things that you buy over and above the status that the possessions give you because then you're more likely to buy things that you actually need rather than things that could cause the Diderot effect to play out. Damien this is me to a T I mean I've only got a look at the garden that I renovated a couple of years ago now and it started off with quite a simple renovation we were digging up some grass putting down some stones then a patio suddenly got laid when the patio got laid we thought well actually the garden furniture that was over there can now move to this section of the garden here which created a space on the main patio and now we could get a dining set and obviously we weren't in the market for a dining set when we started and then we had to move a seat down the end of the garden and of course when the seat went down the end of the garden we needed some lighting down the end of the garden and actually because we were sitting there we were then facing a shed and the shed was a fairly boring so we needed a a mural type design to go on the shed so that we had something nice to look at need need I go on (laughs) I tell you I'm only laughing because Andy's just suddenly burst out with that example on on the fly And, and I know that we all could have lots of examples Andy's garden I've seen it and it looks brilliant it really does but Andy did move into a new house so it was a new house <laughs> a new garden and the Diderot effect obviously what well, now we know what it's called I didn't know it at the time but it's just interesting how it can spiral and um, I think that is a fantastic example which is a great way to finish this week's <laughs> podcast Andy before you get too depressed yeah. so As ever, please do leave a review of the podcast. It really helps us on the iTunes charts and the other apps that you use. I've actually noticed we've not had a review for a little while. So I think you're all just holding back for a big wave of them ahead of the podcast meetup. I'm really excited about meeting everybody at the podcast meetup. Don't forget moneytothemasses.com forward slash events. You'll find all the details of where we're going to be. But it is is in the Cross Keys, the same place we did the last podcast meetup on Grace Church Street in the city of London. And on that, we've said it already before, please don't feel embarrassed or strange or weird about coming along to that. I know what it's like, especially if you're on your own and you're just sort of passing by. I've actually been to another podcast meetup from another podcast that I listened to and I had that exact emotion and fear. And honestly, I didn't look back. It was one one of the best things I did. It was such fun to meet like-minded people talk about the podcast. It was good fun. Yeah, and on that, it's going to be the team as well so Lauren and Harvey are going to be there so please don't just picture in your head what this is going to be it's going to be a group of people having drinks in a pub chatting and getting to know each other and a bit of fun so we all look forward to seeing you so that is it for this week Andy I think that only leaves us to say until next time until next time and see you Thursday see you Thursday (laughs) (laughs) 